Wanda Gillespie is an Australian Aotearoa New Zealand contemporary artist and is driven by her belief in the spiritual potency of physical objects. Familiar objects are reimagined with alternate uses, history, culture and ceremony. Wanda has refined her craft as a wood sculptor through her evocative portrait sculptures which combine ancient and contemporary forms detailed and abstracted. With a BA and MA in Fine Arts, solo and group exhibitions in Australia, New Zealand and internationally, Wanda has also been the recipient of multiple awards, grants and residencies, with titles such as the Ministry for Mystical Reckoning, Counting Frames for a Transient Era, The Ceremonial Procession of Dreamers, her sculptural works explore and challenge fictions and ideas around history, culture, ritual and ceremony and explore the reimagining of known forms. Her bespoke abacus sculptures explore and expand upon the creation of value systems of measurement and encounters between material and mystical worlds. The abacus is a tactile object, a compelling form that invites touch and play. Is it a secret form of communication or is it a way of taking account, a gesture of reconciling our actions personally, collectively, globally? The viewer is invited to look beyond the present moment and its immediate desires toward a larger system of beings and cycles in which we exist. Wonder plays with space, memory and time. Are we viewing artifacts and pieces from the past or the future? Viewers are immersed in Wonder's world and are required to do their own imagining about where the figures and works come from and what they might represent, communicate and contain. With intricate, astonishing details and finishes, Wanda Gillespie is an artist concerned with her craft, the physical properties of her materials. The ancient and modern objects perhaps point to the unseen or act as a conduit for the divine, where physical objects become invested with extra meaning, taking on a power of their own. Wanda's work does leave room for possibilities, room to explore the dynamic between physical and imagined dimensions, from immaterial to material from perceived to imagined realities and back again. We can feel the capacity for magic by being in their presence. So let's find out more about mystical archaeology, the power of objects, and the combination of energy and wood, as we welcome you wherever you are joining us from, and Wanda Gillespie, this week's Friday Feature Artist. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you. That was really amazing. Oh, it's so incredible. I feel like I need to take a breath because I just feel like all of those things just um, I've gone to another place. So before I get too carried away with that, I want to welcome everybody. And uh, this is a pre-record, um, but we'd love to hear where you're tuning in, listening from, and feel free to in the comments um, any questions that you have for Wanda and let us know where you're joining us from because um, we we can try and get back to you with answers but also um, yeah we'd, we'd like to have that two-way conversation so welcome everyone so Wanda I mean firstly congratulations like it's such a big 2023 you did so much like going back all through your Instagram and um, and I do recommend everyone have a look at Wonders Instagram. It was just incredible the amount of work that you did. Um, but I think the first question is, why wood is your material of choice and how did you come to it? Yeah, um, I I didn't start out carving. You know, I went to, I was as a, as a kid really into drawing, went to art school, did media arts as my undergraduate. Um, and I was working a lot with photography and video and started creating these fictions where I was wanting to create fictional artifacts from invented places. And then I was awarded a um, Asia Link residency to Indonesia. And that was really the start of working with wood um, because, you know, they have such incredible wood carving 
in Indonesia and I had this idea that I wanted to create wood carved artifacts um, from a lost island and initially I was working with um, traditional wood carvers over there and then I learned to carve myself but I suppose through the process of making art I so in the in the 2000s I I did some installations with and sculptural works that were more assemblage and worked with perspex and things like that and just realized how much I hated that material and became more interested in in the energetic qualities of different materials and wood in particular having this kind of I don't know in, in Maori they they talk about wairo like a spirit or soul of of, of the wood and um, because it's once living uh, it's it's just got that energy about it that I don't yeah. get with the yeah. materials. That's so interesting yeah. I love that the, the, the idea of um, you know the artifacts and um, whatever you have with whatever you just said before about the the imaginedness of uh you know an artifact but then you know that the sliding door moment of indonesia did you just i mean before you went there did you assume that you, i mean you obviously knew that you were going there to work with wood because you kind of go well if you'd been sent somewhere else would you would the material have been different or that was already part of like that path of wood indonesia and then yeah that's yeah just, I, I, well, yeah, I actually hoped that I would learn to carve and right. then realised that there was no way I was going to be able to learn in that short period of time with the residency obligations because I, I was teaching photography at the university in Bandung and I had, yeah, a performance photograph project happening and then also a wood carving project happening that was out um that was out of the city in Majalinka in West Java um yeah and so had you even um played around with clay and sort of molding that into um you know shapes and figures before that I, I just kind of go well you know or then I'm thinking did you draw or realistically like figures because it just seems like so incredible what you're able to carve um yeah <laughs> yeah well, it really did hurt my brain yeah. to be work, I'm glad. working three-dimensionally it didn't come naturally um I yeah I mean I did that was one thing about being on the residency in in Indonesia especially when I was out in the countryside um a lot of people didn't have English language skills so I was kind of forced to draw my ideas more um, precisely right. yeah. than I had yeah. been before and that was kind of a good push but um, yeah I guess it's it's come after that that I've really uh, learned more about how to sculpt yeah and um i was going to start with what you were doing last week but i have got these images which i'm assuming are from indonesia the ones that we saw in the slideshow there that looked a bit like a lawnmower was is that um could yeah. you from that time yes yeah, so um i i was actually back and forth quite a bit so i did an initial residency um, that was about four months and then I I was living in Melbourne at the time and I studied at the VCA doing a master's and I continued with that work so I got I was lucky to get some um, scholarships through the VCA to return and create more work with these um, amazing wood carvers they made these beautiful ornate bird cages that right. was kind of yeah, bread and butter work. Um, yeah, so that one, th that was the first project that I did with them. And I had been, 
there are a couple of different <laughs> ways that I came to that piece. I'd been um, working a lot in museums as a technician on those elevated work platforms, doing oh, lighting yeah, yeah. and things like that, and kind of daydreaming about what if these could fly? <laughs> yeah. um, and then also uh, there were some toys that children in Indonesia had that had these wings that flapped when the wheels turned. They, they had a little oh. rod that. Um, so I was kind of interested in that kinetic aspect. So these actually have kind of a, when the wheels turn, the scissor goes up and down and the wings flap. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah, so yeah, then I went back and um, we created five more. Yeah, so this is the mm. stupid question. Like that is a complete, like they look like something that would exist, like you said, like an artifact from another time or ceremony or something, but that is a completely made up object that you made up, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah, let's just go back and because it does, it has that sense of... Um, it's again, like I'm going to say this word probably quite a lot in this talk, magical, mystical, spiritual, just cultural, all of those things. It just, um, wow, that's incredible. Before I even get into how on earth the, they were made or work, but um, wow, yeah. okay, great. I'm just going to take a breath with that one. <laughs> yeah, I. so I had, as I was saying before, I had been creating sculptures as artifacts and I kind of developed this story about this lost island in the Java Sea and yeah. kind of mixing real and imagined facts to kind of come up with the story. And my idea with those ones were that they were used in some kind of ritual or ceremony. Um, yeah. And when you say you've made up the story, are you also then actually physically writing the story down somewhere as a story or is it all just something that's kind of a concept in your head? Um, yes, I was. I've kind of moved away from that in recent years. I mean, I sort of was working in that way for quite a few years, which I really enjoyed. And I, I, I'm not, um, I might go back to it, who knows, but I sort of, felt at a certain point that I wanted a more open reading of the sculptures right. that I was making yep. and that by writing those stories the sculptures were becoming quite illustrative. Even though yeah. I did sort of try to leave um, conjecture and room within the stories about, you know, whether it was true or well, you know what facts were real yeah. um I, yeah. Mm. yeah and i imagine being in such a place well both um you know new zealand for the maori culture and indonesia being you know quite close to both strong cultural would to sort of seep into to that notion of stories and mythology and using culture in art um when you're surrounded by it i'm sure that must be a powerful experience yeah, mm. for mm. sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and so now I'm going to skip more to the present. Um, so I saw on your Instagram recently that you installed this piece in um, the Hamilton Boone Sculpture Trail. And I love how, you know, reading about your work, how there's this interest in divine mathematics in nature, and that's an underlying inspiration um, for the counting devices. So can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by that, like the divine mathematic um, thing, concept, and what you're measuring in something like this? Yeah, I guess um, when I'm thinking about the divine mathematics in nature, I'm thinking about, you know, like the Fibonacci spiral, sacred geometry, um, I heard recently that we're actually the Milky Way is a is a Fibonacci spiral that we're actually living within this giant <laughs> Fibonacci spiral, and I kind of like linking. I think with a lot of my work, I'm looking for 
some kind of order and structure for something more um, marvelous and mystical. Yeah. And so it's kind of linking something more esoteric with or, or spiritual with something more um, ordered <laughs> somehow. Yeah. 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 And um, in this particular piece, uh, do the different colours or the different types of wood or the different shape represent something different? Um, not necessarily. Um, I mean, I like people to bring their own interpretation yeah. to the abacus. So it's like I like the idea of there being secret codes and, and being yeah. able to write secret messages with the beads um in terms of the the design and the shape so i'm often looking at landscape and um, plant matter as kind of references for the inner design workings of the abacus so that one um, because um i mean there's not a huge amount happening compared to some of my other abacus yeah. designs but um i was looking at water there's, there's a there's a great river that runs through the city and i was kind of thinking about um environmental things like how um you know the health of the river how how do we measure um, the kind? Of, yeah, I'm sort of interested in measuring the unseen. So, how do we measure things like the unpaid labor of seaweed yeah. or mangroves, or yeah. and yeah. then the deficit of um, you know the pollution that industry are pumping into. <laughs> rivers or, or whatever and the cleanup that 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 will entail for future generations and yeah that kind of um thinking about what what we value how we measure it and and thinking of new more holistic ways of accounting for things and yeah mm. I, I keep it quite open mm. um to interpretation but yeah and I love on your website and again um, I encourage people to visit your website because you've got writings and under there you've just got so many amazing explanations and um, uh, descriptions and things that really do invite you to ponder and think more about these concepts um, which is so interesting so going back to that piece and you say you like to keep it open so but you know I, I'm thinking for people walking past, it would be very difficult to walk past, you know, I'm assuming people do stop and engage with it. Then I guess in a gallery setting, people are probably more apprehensive and I don't know whether it has the little do not touch um, symbol on, but when it's out in the open like that, do people go and move the pieces and do you encourage no. that in both settings in gallery and this or more just in an outdoor setting like that? Yeah, I well, I understand why galleries have to be a bit, yeah, cool, but um, you know, I'd love it if everyone played with, with them, and I, yeah, I really enjoy seeing kids, especially playing yeah. with them. Um, they seem to, you know, have so much fun with it, so yeah, and that description of open, um, because you, I would imagine, I would you know go up closer stand there and then attempt to move them and then realize that you can't move them from one line to another you know like people probably on computer games like tetris where they're sliding something um up to the next level you know you kind of have it's a dead end and then you'd be thinking but does that represent something and you know you'd start to think about all of those um uh why all those questions of what what is being said to me here by this piece so anyway that I'm just having a little bit of a mind mind chat with myself here um yeah. and was, also with that piece oh sorry no you go well I was just going to say with, with with the actual shape of the frame 
I was um, thinking about the home, Faranui, the, the, the shape, um, I guess, sort of placemaking and yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we've got so many amazing images um, here that I'm going to um, show with everyone today. Um, so for me, there's your work does work on so many levels of that they're beautiful objects, so there's that. Then there's the meaning, which are mind-blowing, divine, mathematics, sacred geometry, all of those things. And then there's the crafting of how... <laughs> how you construct these objects. And for that one, um, I invite people to look at your Instagram because you did do a process video of the making of that and just um, a reminder of the machinery and, you know, working with wood is not, I imagine, easy. It doesn't, yeah, it's not something that I would be comfortable doing. So, um, yeah, I just invite everyone to have a look at your process video because that's incredible. So going back to more work, um, these, and there's the close-ups here, just beautiful, beautiful pieces. And when we were talking um, in preparation for this, um, you mentioned uh, Herman Hess and the glass bead game and how that had an impact on you. Um, could you briefly tell us more about the meaning of that book and how it led to your interest in the abacus? Yeah, well... Uh... I actually don't, it's kind of more a link that I've made Since. in recent times. Right. I don't know if if it was a direct kind of read the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. This, but, <laughs> no, that's um, an idea. Yeah, I think it was just in there somewhere. Um, but I felt very captivated by the story. It's, it's about um, this young man called Joseph Necht and he um, goes to, it, it's set in the future and he goes to live in this kind of academic community where it's almost like a monastery and they play this game called the glass bead mm -hmm. game and in the book they never really clearly tell you what the game looks like or Oh, exactly okay. how it's played I kind of imagine it's like a go I don't know if you know the game go the Japanese no. but I kind of imagine that it's glass beads on a board right um and the combination of beads the, the beads hold different meanings and right. um these people are all very well educated and though though the placements of the beads could bring together different branches of knowledge like um a, an ancient chinese garden with a classical piece of music and i think i was just attracted to this um objects pointing to different meanings and ideas which i guess all are is but also yes combining different sources yeah. of knowledge yeah. and yeah it, it, it was quite um the game itself they would they would pause and meditate between each move and so there was quite a kind of um religious feeling mm. to the, mm. the game and, and just captured my imagination yeah, yeah. The, i mean they're so beautiful but then also tactile and you know when I was looking at um these ones and instantly you kind of just sort of imagine yourself walking up to them moving the beads and then I thought oh I don't actually know how an abacus works you know I, I kind of had a kid's version and you sort of and then I was you know researching oh yeah they mean different things in terms of units of um hundreds thousands or whatever when you're making something like that, are you having a meaning in what the rows or beads mean or is, that, again, um, that more of an open thing? I've left it open, yeah. It's it's more symbolic, I suppose. Um, I have had in the past people ask for specific numbers. 
Right. Yeah. Um, when they've wanted something commissioned and they've had, oh, you know, like someone asked, I've got six grandchildren. Can you have six <laughs> beads on each <laughs> row? Um, but yeah, generally, I'm I'm keeping it more open. Yeah, and maybe and it's it's a type of maths that doesn't make sense in our <laughs> world. <laughs> maybe it makes sense in another parallel dimension. <laughs> I love that maths that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I'm there, um, and so I'm imagining that you would have to plan these quite mathematically and quite methodically, like with graph paper and stuff. Is is <laughs> are you drawing them by hand or uh, on the computer or? Um, yes, so I, you know, it, it is a bit old school, but I have been drawing them by hand, um, and yeah, more recently using grid paper, and then, but then I do um, scan them and and get a digital file made, so that could, because I'm actually cutting them from a flat piece sheet of metal, and then I'm shaping. Um, right. all the metal rods to be round. So that part is actually quite time consuming. I often don't, yeah, people don't realise that part of the process, but. Um, oh, yeah. No, I'm not saying there's anything about this work as a, as a quick process. Um, so obviously in both of those, the wood is different. What are your kind of go-to materials um, for the frames or the little pieces that you kind of regularly use? Um, if I can use local, you know, native materials, I will. Like that last one that you showed, that was um, Rewa Rewa floorboards from an old Auckland Council building that oh. was... Um, the the lighter one or the dark one? Uh, the lighter one. Okay, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I quite liked that kind of previous history to the, yeah. to the wood. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah. And the black one, I think, was Cody. But uh, yeah, if I can use native woods, I will. Um, and because I, that sort of, I like that sense of connecting to the land that I'm living on and, yeah, um, yeah the energetic qualities that brings mm -hmm. up with the work. Um, with the beads, so some of the, I mean, with the larger ones, I'm, you know, wood turning, turning on the lathe, but with these smaller ones, Mostly I'm buying them. I do have some of them from bo um, broken Japanese soroban. Um, and part of the reason I'm using those is that I really like this idea, this, this concept, I've forgotten the Japanese word for it, but it's about how tools that are over 100 years old acquire a kind of spirit or soul. Um, so these are, yeah, probably, I think, definitely over 100-year-old abacuses, and I'm just using some of those beads in my work. Oh, oh wow. That, yeah, what a um, full circle, yeah, kind of, uh, I don't know, I use all those equation metaphor words there, but, um, yeah, that, that's an amazing thought. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Segwaying on to my next thing before I go back to some more abacuses, abacais, multiple plurals. Um, so I love how your work explores the math, but spiritual spirituality, culture, and history. Um, and so was that the whole sort of storytelling something that you grew up with? Or was that just, did that just come sort of when you went to Indonesia in the residency or was that always part of your sort of creativity art practice? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's developed over time. Like I, I was trying to think, where, you know, whether I had a lot of that 
I guess, uh, you know, there were fairy tales and Māori myths and things yeah. that growing up and my um, mum is in theatre, so I spent a lot of time in the back of theatres, at rehearsals, drawing pictures. So I guess I was exposed to that kind of performative yeah. storytelling. Yeah. Um, but in terms of my actual artwork, I don't know. I guess uh, a big inspiration was I read um, the Argentinian writer Georges Louis Borges, I think that's how you pronounce it, and he wrote this amazing story called Tlon Akbar or this Territus, and it was about this um, invented planet that these academics had come together and uh -huh. created and then slowly um, objects from that planet were found here and then it, history was rewritten and you know I don't know yeah. I, I was just quite attracted to that story and that sort of um, got me on the yeah. <laughs> path of writing stories and creating artifacts yeah, definitely a common uh, thread I can see developing or, you know, existing in your work. And so while people might be going, oh, okay, so we're doing objects and beads, then I wanted to show this, which is a change of pace. So beautiful and love the, I mean, the detail is incredible and the tiny wee abacus. Um, could you tell us more about this piece and what it means or represents or the thinking behind it? Yeah, that's probably bigger than what you realise. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's probably about maybe 1.5 metres with the... Oh, okay. So the abacus <laughs> might be more like... No, the yeah. abacus is probably about oh, okay. quite, quite big. Um yeah, so that, so I created that last year while I was on this artist residency on Waiheke. And um, I was, I created this series called Crossing the Rubicon. And yeah. I was, yeah, um, so I did a lot of smaller figures and then that Golden Boy one was, was, was a larger version of the small, yeah, the smaller figures. But the idea was I, I had been, we, there had been a lot of flooding last year. I think there was a lot in Australia as well. Yeah. Um, but in New Zealand, there was a huge amount and it was quite um, destructive. And it really got me thinking a lot about the rising sea levels. I was, the residency I was on um, was on a small island and just thinking about the future of these Pacific Islands and um, this feeling that we're sort of in a um, time of transience or change, that it's kind of a, um, like a rite of passage or something, that the era that we're in at the moment and that we're, crossing a point of no return mm. um, and yeah but there's a hopefulness mm. <laughs> to this <laughs> to this crossing and I, I suppose the abacus um I kind of imagined that it, it represented that we're at a time of reckoning and re re-evaluating what we're doing and where we're going um but I also mm. had thought of, oh, perhaps, uh, perhaps this is this boy is from an invented <laughs> island where mathematic objects are are revered, like religious items or something like that. Mm. And yeah, so, the, that, yeah. sorry, the gold often does represent that sort of religious or, um, uh, you know, uh, higher. Uh, the value in in the material um but that's wood so is that painted or how are the colors added to this piece yeah that's painted so that was that was quite fun because I mean 
I guess I've got a tendency to leave the wood tone because I don't want to, you know, I want people to see the um, the formations, the natural mm. formations in the wood. Mm. But that particular piece was carved with jalliotong, which is oh, not okay. so interesting in terms of the wood grain. It's very straight. Um, it imported from Malaysia, so it's it's not as um, interesting. And it was laminated, several pieces laminated together wow. to create. So, yeah, it was. I really enjoyed bringing color into. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a gorgeous piece. Um, and so, even though I'm keen to get back to the abacus, but before I do that, I can't go past. This piece, and I am taking a breath because it just has such meaning and presence and is incredible. Maybe tell us how big it is, but then if you can tell us, um, yeah, the, the thinking behind this gorgeous piece. Um, so those are two different pieces, but they're from the yeah. same series um, and they're probably about, in terms of the face size, they're probably about three quarter. They're close to human mm -hmm. size. Um, and I started carving those when we moved back from Melbourne to Auckland, Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, and uh, living with my parents and my brother, his wife, <laughs> and their two kids. Um, and so that, his wife, Masako, she's Japanese. She was one of my muses. And then oh. the other one is their daughter, Rena. Oh. And also their son, was Kai, was also one, one of my muses. And it was quite handy having them yeah. um, at hand to sort of reference as I was going along with the carving. Yeah, um, so beautiful. But the, and it is, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the, the kind of the, the narrative I created. So with that work, I also was creating a fiction and it was that these were artifacts from a future time where post some man-made environmental catastrophe, um, the world was now in a process of rejuvenation and these were illustrative <laughs> objects that were being sent back to the present day to help us with some kind of spiritual evolution that might help us bypass the the terrible <laughs> destruction that was that we were about to create. Um, uh, hope and rejuvenation. I love that. And are these from the same series, or that not? was. That was a lecture. Yeah, they're different ones, actually. Okay. Um, that one, uh, what was that called? Dream Believer? Ah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, that, that was kind of more like sometimes, so that was, that was a series that didn't have a fiction attached to it, but I kind of had this feeling that I'm often plucking these figures out from some sort of in-between unseen world. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. one's eyes closed again, like maybe meditating or, or dreaming. Or <laughs> So you mentioned that um, the relatives were amused, but then other times, you know, do you always have in mind what the characters look like or are they kind of taking shape as you're carving or do you always know? Yeah. Um, I'm usually taking photographs of people as references, but then as I go along, um, at a certain point I sort of throw all that away and sort of <laughs> feel like, you know, what does the... Where does this? Yeah, yeah. 
soul <laughs> want to go? What, what, what form does this material want to take? And so I don't think of the person that was the reference that much. Um, once they're finished, yeah. I mean, some of them do look a lot more like the muses than others. Yeah. Yeah, that's so but I, I'm quite happy to sort of veer off. The, at the and at first stages, I'm I'm measuring everything carefully, and I've got calipers, and I'm oh. back and forth between um, printouts of photographs. I, I photograph the people from the front, from the side, from the other side, from the back. Right. Um, Yes. And so I am measuring a lot, but then at a certain point I like to just let that go and, yeah. 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 Wow, that does make sense because I kind of have this notion of me mucking around with clay and just kind of, you know, things just happening or not happening, but that precision behind something does make a lot of sense. Um, and I loved seeing how the figures are often with the abacus in the gallery as well. I don't know if this is from the same show. Um, no, but, they're different, but yeah. 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 Um, how, how in, in this particular image, did the two relate to the same story or are they just, just different stories but seen together? Yeah, well, so... That one, he's um, he's a subtle being from some kind of spirit realm, and I at that time the abacuses were called um, higher consciousness integrating calculators, and I kind of <laughs> like the idea of once again kind of grounding spirituality or something mystical in something like a structure like a calculator. Yeah. Um, so in that exhibition, I also had these higher thought form paintings, you know, trying to represent things from the unseen realms, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you don't necessarily have to answer this question, but I feel like I'm going to have to ask it. Um, in the last few years, Hilma F. Clint, her exhibition was in Sydney and I think it was in Auckland as well, um, and Georgiana Houghton. So, you know, both of those artists did their work, came from this other spiritual realm and at that time as we find more and more about those artists and the way that they worked, you know, spirituality wasn't something odd in their time. It was something that was quite incorporated into their life. Um, is that something that, you know, do you meditate or is there some way that you have like a spiritual practice in your own work or is it just something you like to research and imagine or find out more about? Um, I think it's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've definitely always been open to the, uh, I, you know, as a child I often saw like ghosts and spirits and I've had um, experiences of waking up floating above my body. Um, so I've been quite comfortable with the idea of that separation, that there, that there are, you, you can exist beyond your physical body and that there are um, other <laughs> beings around. Um, yeah, I guess I, well, that's actually something that that was encouraged a lot the year before last I studied um Maori Fukaido carving that's traditional Maori wood carving and at the start of each session we were taught a karakia that were a, a prayer um that sort of acknowledged um where the where the wood was coming from and and different you know mm -hmm. energy um and if you were doing it really properly you should be doing it all the time while you're working and, and 
breathing at the same time as saying this katakia. Um, yeah, for myself, I guess I'm, I'm often sort of like grounding myself and then imagining that I have this creative team in the spirit world that are sort of uh, helping me with my work. Uh, yeah, but then at the same time, um, so we, my husband's Russian and we go to the Russian Orthodox Church. So I also pray <laughs> often when I'm working with machinery yeah. and I'm, I'm feeling like a bit nervous with it. <laughs> I'll start praying a lot. Yeah. Wow. But, um, yeah, I kind of, yeah, I'm open to lots of different Yeah. Ideas. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I wouldn't be ask, doing my job if I hadn't have asked you that and if we hadn't have discussed it because there's obviously something else that's going on here. Um, and the idea of the unseen um, and being open to all of those things, um, you know, to use the word, it in thinking doesn't make sense because it's something that you can't you, you know you can't overthink there's that trust and that um it's beyond it's beyond our you know logical thinking but being open to it and just um you know often the only closest I can think of is is yoga when people say things like breathe through your feet and you know that doesn't mean that literally because you can overthink that to the point but you just yeah, you kind of, it's the, it's, it's something else, something else completely. Anyway. Yeah. So, I, do, um, um, I, th I do think of the, just the process of creating as being a kind of a spiritual act and you're, yeah, you're, I, I sometimes imagine that everything I'm going to make has actually already been made. I've already made it in a parallel <laughs> well, universe good. and I'm just bringing it forth or, yeah. But there's this like collective consciousness that artists are tapping into. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I can definitely relate to that thing of all the ideas in the universe being up there and it's just which antenna we have on at the time that's picking up those various ideas. Um, you know, I can relate to that. And then that idea that you might have created things before in a, in another universe, for me, I'd be like, but I can't, it's a bit misty. I can't see it. I need I need more, more detail in what I've created <laughs> before. Yeah, I need to, what was it? And was it any good? And yeah, anyway, um, so... <laughs> The other thing I guess that I find um, interesting, not a contradiction, is that, you know, growing up in school, maths is not perceived as the most creative thing. And I think that's a real shame because when you find out about more about creative maths, um, you know, it can be creative. Um, so this idea that these sort of mathematical things keep popping up in your work um, is, is intriguing to me. Um, could you tell us more about the thinking behind these pieces? Yeah, so, um, well, I was, so I had been doing all these abacuses and I thought, um, what else, what other kind of mathematic curiosities could I look at for inspiration? Um, and I did look at, Count like ancient counting tablets that were quite interesting from Mesopotamia and places like that. But those um, Klein bottles kind of captured my imagination because they're, they're a mathematic concept. But this, this mathematician, Felix Klein, came up with in 18-something or other, and they can't actually be made in our three-dimensional universe so people have made versions of them in glass but it's an object that he's thought of that can never be made wow. um, and so I was kind of pushing that even further to be more of a two almost two-dimensional a flattened mm. version of the different because there are, there's people have been quite creative with um, the glass versions and, and, and how 
the shapes and how they work. But um, yeah, and then I was using chip carving um, to sort of show where the inner inner tubing would be if it were, because it's meant to have an. <laughs> it's hard to explain. I I recommend some you know people looking up Klein bottles. Um, they have like it. They're kind of an inside out. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think in something I read, it was like the Mobius strip, which folds back on itself, that sort of um, thing. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so but the I, detail is carved, not an inlay, isn't it? Just, just for those who wanted to know about that. <laughs> yeah, so that's chip carving just with a knife, which is quite a nice process. Um, yeah. And I like that sort of, again, linking to the divine maths in nature there's they're very geometric and mathematic it's it's mm. all basically triangles that i'm cutting out to make those mm. different shapes um yeah i love just that all these artifacts are being created and um but i'm conscious of time and i do want to just go on to this one because that's next level um could you tell us a bit more about this one so that's also um the higher yeah higher consciousness integrating calculators and um i've used gum nuts as the beads um mm -hmm. even though i was back here in new zealand we had a big um tree opposite us where we were living so i was collecting all the gum nuts and um yeah, hollowing them and, and dipping them in resin. Um, but again, yeah, thinking about them as these higher consciousness integrating calculators, like a tool that you might use to help you with your spiritual practice somehow. And having them in a circle like that, I sort of imagined Stonehenge being, mm. you know, one of our earliest, what they say, earliest version of a calculator. Um, yeah, and it, and it brings that kind of ritualistic ceremonial feeling. Having it yeah, in yeah, definitely. It's so interesting, isn't it? Like there's the object and then there's the placement of the object and then grouping of an object. How it already takes on those different um, connotations of, of so many things. Um, and at the feet, even though the feet look like stone, are they wood or? They're actually concrete. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I I sculpted them in clay and then made a mould and then, yeah, I was kind of enjoying that um, contrast between mm. Mm. wood and another material like concrete. Yeah. 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 And again, because time is running away, I do just want to show these places um, incorporating um, the grevillea or the more natural elements and yeah, just going back to that artefact and relic, um, but that spiritual, like you can imagine them being in a place of worship or, you know, they, they just... Yeah, could could you tell us more about the thought behind them? Yeah, so that those were um, for an exhibition at Stockroom in Kyneton, Victoria, Australia, um, called the Ministry for Mystical Reckoning. Love that and time. it was a thank you. It was a series of abacuses, um, and those ones. So I'm often looking at landscape to abstract the form, but those were looking at plants. So, yeah, the warata and the, um, there was an orchid and, yes, grevillea. Um, and, yeah, using brass, because it has that goldy kind of colour, it has that sense of, maybe religious importance or some kind of mm. value. Um, yeah, and the frames are, are a native Tortora 
it's a wood from here um yeah, yeah. and i guess the, the shapes were also kind of abstracted from leaf plant shapes um mm -hmm. yeah and in that exhibition i had one figure that was the mathematician who was sort of like the chief accountant for all the abacuses in the space um and there were a few others that were you had more of a like an hourglass design mm -hmm. in, in their internal rod work and I, I had been thinking a lot about the nature of time and yeah especially through the COVID years that that sense of it being quite elastic and um yeah yeah I was wondering that like do you think the, I mean, are you a timekeeper? What? How do you work with time on a daily basis? Is it something that you know you're not conscious of in terms of watches and clocks, or is it like the big blocks of time and weeks and months and years? Like, yeah, how? Because I always find like time is chasing me, and I'm running out of time. What's What's your relationship with time? <laughs> um. Yeah, I find it very curious. Um. Those sculptures, I had the ideas for the hourglass abacuses had come from another residency at Karikari in Auckland. And there's this beautiful beach that I, I, you'd go for walks and you'd think you'd only gone for half an hour, but you'd actually gone for three hours. And wow. the scale of things was quite both in size and in time, seem to be warped there. And, mm. yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I do I think, have to think Yeah, that. it sounds like you'd probably <laughs> let yourself be open and in go to that because um, to have that time disappearing for three hours, um, yeah, that also says to me that you're open to that happening, which is, is also lovely. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that can happen on residency, but then yeah. when I'm back in, <laughs> you know, school routine and things like that, um, then it's yeah, more true. like yeah, yeah. On time. That's good. That's good to know that, um, yeah, those things apply as well. So yeah. um, what are you working on at the moment or what are you looking forward to? What's coming up? Um, so... Yeah, it's been quite a busy time, actually. I've got two exhibitions, two solo exhibitions opening in the next two weeks. So one is called The Reckoning, um, which is at Waiheke Art Gallery. And, yeah, that's um, some of my abacuses and some portraits. This, oh, this guy will be there. Oh, <laughs> amazing. Um, and then I've got another solo show that's crossing the Rubicon that's got more of those figures, full figures. Um, okay. And that's at Sanderson Contemporary in Newmarket in Auckland. And, yeah, after that, I, it'll be quite good to <laughs> have, a, have a rest and a re-think um, about my direction because I'll be moving to Melbourne after that in March. So um kind of re-establishing myself yeah. back in Australia and looking for exhibition opportunities and yeah. A whole new neighborhood of possibilities and things to discover. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Um and I just have to show this picture because it's so beautiful. Um just there's something um, about um so where where was that? So that was on Waiheke. They have this great, um, it's coming up sculpture on the Gulf mm. and this sculpture trail that goes along the headlands. Mm. Yeah. I love that contrast. Um, yeah. Well, I think I'm totally speechless. I thank you so much for sharing um, all the, yeah, all the stories and um process experience and it's just been wonderful to chat to you and find out more about all your wonderful work it just um yeah you know it's so so many things to think about um and yeah you do it so well so thank you for your time. 
thank you. Thank you for all your great questions. It's, yeah, you can be so kind of like <laughs> stuck in your own little world and it's nice to be asked oh. about you. Yeah. Yeah, and it gives us, um, you know, to use that old thing, food for thought because there's so many things that we now need to go and explore. So if you just wait there for a minute and I'm going to play our outro, but and thank you everyone for uh, tuning in and um, please feel free to leave some comments or questions and we'd love to hear from you. And um, thank you, Wanda. Thank you.